This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? Uh, usually, yes. Well, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. Yeah, you can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. Yeah, a friend of mine's doing it. She said she reached out to them and they got back with her right away. Yeah, I think it's great. You get to avoid the uncomfortable waiting rooms. You can do it from anywhere in the world. And there's all kinds of counselors to choose from. Yeah, you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room like you said. There you go. And it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. And financial aid is available, which is very cool. Oh, sweet. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. So visit their website and use our promo code. And what is that promo code? M-I-F. That stands for music is funny. Yes. So if you use our code, it gets you 10% off the first month. Yeah. Go to www.betterhelp.com slash M-I-F. And that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Dot com slash myth. This podcast is also sponsored by Pure Spectrum CBD. Yeah, CBD is a big thing right now. I mean, they sell it in gas stations. You can buy it, you know, anywhere. And it's kind of an unregulated industry. Yeah, I had a weird experience where I got some Delta 8 gummies. And it was such a trip. It was not safe. Right. (laughs) If you go to Pure Spectrum CBD, you can trust these guys. They're from Colorado. They've been doing this for a long time. Everything's tested. They come from, a, I think it's a family farm in Colorado. So, you know, CBD is great. It's great for well, your aches and pains, all kinds of stuff. Anxiety. Yeah. And if you get it from pure spectrum CBD, you're not going to fail a drug test. You are, you're not going to get high. It is pure CBD, just the medicinal qualities. And you can trust that. Yeah. CBD is one cannabinoid away from THC, but it's not the psychoactive cannabinoid. So it's just all the healing properties of cannabis without getting high. That part's kind of a bummer. But for those (laughs) who don't want to get high, these guys are the one to go to to get all of your CBD products. You can trust them. They've been around forever. And uh, you can save some money with our promo code. MIF10. So go to purespectrum.com slash MIF10 to get 10% off all your orders. And that's MIF, M-I-F, 10 stands for music is funny, but it's shorthand. <laughs> so anyway, check out Pure Spectrum CBD. And now, on to the show. I'm starting to get worried now. I'm thinking maybe I'm in a coma in Alaska. Maybe I died and this is like limbo. I'm starting to get really serious worries. Live from the Willie Nelson and Friends Museum Showcase in Nashville, Tennessee. It's Music is Funny. Musicians talking to comedians about music and comedy. With your hosts, Raylan Nelson and Jonathan Bright. So smoking, I'm so high, I keep talking, I'm drunk, but I'm still drinking too. Welcome back to Music is Funny. I'm Raylan Nelson. And I'm Jonathan Bright from the Raylan Nelson Band. Hey, if you want to come see us live, we have shows coming up. Actually, this Saturday, June 26th in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee at Arts of the Berg Festival, July 3rd in Tacoma, Washington, July 10th in Plainville, Georgia, July 23rd, Panama City Beach, July 24th in Santa Rosa Beach, and then September 18th in Sacramento, California. So come see us live. Come see us live. All right, this next guy we got up, I mean, he's a hilarious stand-up. He's got great comedy. We're going to put the links to check it all out. But the story that he told us on how he got to even become a comedian, it's one of the most mind-bending things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, I still can't wrap my head around it. Um, I mean, there was let's, there was Mormonism. Armed robbery. The Witness Protection Program. And then a salvia trip that lasted for eight years. I, you know what? I, I, we, we just can't do... Like, let's just get to it. Yeah, without further ado, Steve Cantwell. So, Steve, thank you for joining us on Music is Funny. This is my friend and guitar player, JB. Nice to meet you, buddy. Nice to meet you. So we have to start off the show with music because that's what this is. But I can't wait to um, ask you other questions. So what kind of music do you remember loving as a kid? Your first favorite music? God. Uh, The first music that I chose because of my peer group was probably second grade. 
everybody in my elementary school was into Kiss big time. So yeah. the first album, the first album that I ever got from my grandmother for birth for uh, Christmas, first LP I ever owned was Kiss Destroyer, and I used to just listen to that that album over and over again and just marvel at like the. The album art and just you know i was a little mormon kid so i was like kiss was like the first introduction uh -oh. uh, mormon so i would say i started off with kiss and then by the time i was about 12 or so uh the the first group that i ever chose because it was my choice and probably was not popular with my friend group was probably sticks i got really into sticks for a while paradise theater was the first uh, cassette that i ever purchased and i listened to that until there were probably no no magnetic particles left on the tape anymore <laughs> Of cassettes. So, yeah. Did, did you continue on? Was it like, was music, I a lot of people, it's time and place and, you know, in their early teens and twenties, they never really, they, they kind of stop there. They hear some new stuff, but never really continue on. What did, did you land like that? Or are you somebody that kept seeking out new music as you went along? Well, I got into radio when I was about 14. And then uh, every time I would get hired at a new station, it seems that they had a new format. And so that was like a crash course in God everything i worked in an adult contemporary station for a while i worked at a country western station in an eskimo village for a while and so i just you know you kind of get immersed into whatever music you're paid to listen to essentially right that's a trip and did you uh what was i going to say like when you were young was there music around the house were your parents into uh, you mentioned you were brought up mormon was it a musical household did you get anything very much so yeah. mormon families what is what do mormon families listen to music wise? Uh, Osmond, of course donny osmond no i'm kidding yeah but of course <laughs> yeah you you we and i was a kid at the time when donny and marie had their variety show that Me very too. much wanted to yeah really yep. it just it wanted to be i don't know what they were trying to be whether they're trying to be saturday night live or or uh probably laughing that's probably what they thought but uh listen to donny and marie under protest uh <laughs> and my dad was really into the beach boys his yeah. entire life and taught me what a what a, a genius brian wilson was and uh and was really into neil diamond and that, so those are the two influences that were constantly playing around my house well, it could have been a lot worse that's not bad yeah it's pretty good so apparently yeah. the mormons have good taste in music to answer your question yeah my yeah. mom my mom kept me really sheltered so it was uh Besides old country, it was like Amy Grant and Pat, uh, Sandy Patty, Margaret Becker, a bunch of Christian artists. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was Kiss and ACDC and all that and more along the lines there. Yeah, I ventured okay. out. I ventured out in my, you know, early teens. But yeah, that's how pretty much I was. Growing. OK, so. Well, I know you've got some crazy stories. Yeah, I've and I want to hear them. I'm, so I'm we, in, we need I'm to get from. In suspense. We need to get from, like, how do you how do you go from where you are? uh to comedy like at what point did, were you into comedy as a kid is that something you just stumbled upon later it, i think it's something that i stumbled upon later my dad was a mark twain impersonator uh so he would tour in the summers with this one-man show where he would dress up like mark twain and just go in front of audiences and do a, a 90 minute show where he basically uh just did readings of from Mark Twain stuff dressed as Mark Twain. And so that was the first time I ever kind of got that idea that that could be done, but that was a little too early for, and this was the seventies. So this was, you know, if you wanted to find stand-up comedy in the seventies, you had to go to either New York or Los Angeles mostly. And we were in this little mountain town in Utah. So uh, my dad uh, was probably the first for sure was the first person that I ever saw that was uh, serious about being a performer and then I just kind of, uh, I did that a little bit as a kid. He got me into, into musical theater and uh, did a few things like that. But then I just sort of forgot it. I got to be a really serious Mormon. I was uh, kind of a Mormon preacher. I owned a little business on the side, but mostly my heart was, uh, was with uh, talking about Joseph Smith and the, and the angel Moroni and just seeing how many people I could trick into that shit. <laughs> and so... And and I was real serious about that until I was 40. You know, I was, uh, 
know, I don't know, I don't know how, how, how you want me to get into these stories, but I essentially, to, I think we need to get back to how do you go from Utah to Alaska? So Utah to Alaska, when I, um, uh, my dad died. And uh, after he died, I decided that I was going to uh, go to Orlando and start a janitorial company to kind of help uh, provide for our, our growing family. Uh, did well at it. Uh, and, and so much so that a guy approached me one night and offered to buy half the janitorial company. He wanted to get into the janitorial field and thought the best way would be to be buy half of a small janitorial company. So that's what I ended up doing. I ended up selling half my janitorial company to this guy who I had just met. And um, that guy, over the course of the six months that I knew him, uh, slowly revealed to me that he had murdered his mother-in-law for life insurance money. Oh. And, and I had no idea. Yeah, and I had no idea if he was, if he was full of shit or if he, this is before the days of the internet when you could just get on and find out if there was an unsolved murder someplace. How did he kill and her? He waited for her in the morning for her to come out and start her car. And he killed her with a knife. And, uh, Oh my God. Later, lay her in her on her front porch basically to be found by her son and then waited for her son to find her and watched as her son found her and freaked out because he hated her son jesus and told me all of these details and then would not shut up about it to the point where i thought that he was either trying to fuck with me uh this you know little mormon guy i was in my mid-20s at this point I thought maybe he was trying to scare me away from the other half of the janitorial business. I couldn't think for the life of me why somebody would confess. Somebody who'd never been to my home was was confessing to me over and over and over again all these detailed details about killing his mother-in-law. So um, <laughs> finally had the last straw. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> right? So... I did what the only thing that you can do in those days. I hired a private investigator to see if there was a if there was an unsolved murder someplace that matched matched this very specific set of details that he had told me. And so, um, didn't hear anything back from the private investigator. They didn't really tell me how long that was supposed to take. But a couple of weeks later, I got a knock on my on my door late at night from a couple of homicide detectives from Cincinnati who'd come down to Orlando and wanted to know. How I know so much about this fucking case that they've been working about this woman that had been stabbed to death in, in Cincinnati. And so I just repeated to them all of the minute details that he had been filling my head with for the last six months. And they exactly matched the, the things that weren't in the newspaper for this poor woman's murder in Cincinnati. And so uh, long story short, they were like, there's no physical evidence except for the fact that he told you all of these details that only the murderer would know. So if you disappear or if he kills you or if one of his friends just scares you, uh, we, we have no case. So you have to go someplace. So um, we're going to send you to Alaska. So they sent me to Anchorage, Alaska. They told me it would be six months. It turned out to be two and a half years. And by the time by the time the trial happened and he was found guilty and was sentenced to, to for life in prison. And uh, so that's how I got to Alaska. So wait, wait, wait a minute. So many questions. I know. I know. Did they choose Alaska for you? Did you have a choice of where to go? Did they? So so I had worked a radio job in Alaska years before in an Eskimo village. And so I kind of had Alaska in my head as a super remote place. So as we were brainstorming in places that they could send me, I said, why not send me to Alaska? It's far away. You know, it's hard to get to. And so they were fine with that. I didn't want to go back to that Eskimo village because that was maybe a little too Alaska for my taste. But I wanted to go someplace with a Costco. So they they sent me to Anchorage. So maybe uh, we even have to back up further now. So you were in Alaska before that. How did you get to Alaska the first time? So I wanted to <laughs> save money for a Mormon mission. And uh, needed to needed to come up with ten thousand dollars for my Mormon mission. A Mormon so, mission? Where were you going to go? Well, they well, decide for you. Yeah, you have to go. Was ah. it six years? Four years? Two years? Two, two years. years from the ages of nineteen to twenty-one. Every Mormon boy gets sent somewhere on the planet for two years. They teach you the language, and you basically 
sling that Joseph Smith door to door for two years for them. Okay. So you got, you need money for that trip. So you figure Alaska's cheap. I can get a gig there and save money. To yeah. Get that. Okay. I, I've been working in radio for all through high school. And there was always ads in the back of Radio and Records magazine that would that talk that were these radio stations in Alaska that desperately needed people to come up and work there, and they offered fantastic amounts of money. I have a and so I signed up. Yes, I have, I have another question. So you have to pay the Mormon Church to go do missionary work for them. So you don't have to pay the Mormon Church, but you have to have enough money to go for two years wherever they send you without having a job because they want you to, you're not allowed to work during those two years. So $10,000 uh, living like a monk is enough to get gotcha. you through. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for answering that. I was, I was curious if they were charging yeah. to go do things for them. All right. And you know, your parents will pay for it if you don't have it. But if you, if you want to be able to hold your head up, you kind of are expected to pay for your own mission. And you have to go. It's, you can't. It's mandatory. And so did you go do it? I, I did not go. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I saved all my money, but ended up getting tricked by some girl in this Eskimo village into having sex, which I had never done before. And it blew my mind. And so I was, uh, I then got married. I, I showed up. How does someone trick you into having sex? Day. Oh, you know, just the rub it around the outside kind of thing. And then, you know, <laughs> that, that, that old thing. So was this an Eskimo lady? <laughs> no, it was, it oh, was, uh, <laughs> it was the only other white, it was the only white girl in the village, which is a terrible way to pick uh, a soulmate. <laughs> How long did you know her before you got married? Did you guys rub noses together for Eskimo kisses? Oh, stop it. <laughs> we rubbed everything together. I knew her for about six weeks before I married her. Four to six weeks, probably. You married her? What? Yeah. The, where did we get? Okay. She so, and there was no there was no place to get married in this Eskimo village. So to get married in an Eskimo village, there's basically a fax machine at the, at the post office. And you go there and you fill out a form and you fax it to Juno. And they and the receipt that the that the fax machine shits out, that's essentially your marriage license. So that's oh how I got married. We fa we faxed a fax to Juno, uh, had a small celebration, you know, and uh, how old were you? God, I was nineteen. Yeah, I was nineteen when I got married. Yeah, it's a bad time to make that decision. Really. Did yours last? Did Agreed. yours last? Absolutely not. No. Mine lasted 21 years, which is the worst answer of all, because I wasted most of the good part of my life married to some woman who I would not have chosen her if I would have waited another two years, you know? Yeah. Nobody knows who they are at 19, you know, yeah. it's not a good time. So you go from there, and that's when you went to Orlando and bought. Now, did I hear before you sold uh, part of that cleaning business to this guy that you and your brother got robbed or held up or something like that? Yeah. yeah so I'm uh, telling you, there's a million of these. We're I, having think, I think this is because this is your karma for not going on that mission. I think so. I chose the, <laughs> I chose the, the path least the path, uh, least travel and it kicked the shit out of me really by most of my path entire of most, life. Path of most resistance. Yeah. yeah. Most <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's what happened. I think that um, you were supposed to experience these things for these incredible stories. Well, okay, so, going, so I know. Come on. Okay, so you got robbed. So my brother and I get tied. Do you want me to talk about that robbery? Yeah, or let's, just, let's get that real quick. <laughs> so the thing that made me, uh, the thing that convinced me that I might be overwhelmed on this uh, whole janitorial thing and that I might need a, uh, a partner was one uh, New Year's Eve, my brother and I were, because this was the days before cell phones where you could just call around to the janitors that worked for you and make sure that everybody had shown up for work. So on New Year's Eve, there was going to be a lot of people calling out for work and you would have no idea. And the, on the places that we were contracted to clean would be stomped, you know, so we would have to make sure that they were clean by driving around and checking each place. So we were driving around at like three o'clock in the morning, checking places. And we popped in this little restaurant called the Briar Patch in Winter Park, Florida, and uh, went in and just poked around, made sure that everything was clean. 
And then we're coming back out to the truck and we opened up the door and there was just guns pointed in our face. And so these guys pulled us inside the restaurant, went head to toe and duct taped us up, up like, like a spark cocoon, dragged us back by the walk-in freezer, which was particularly terrifying because we had been reading in the newspaper that there was a crew of guys working Orlando that used to go in duct tape up the, the cleaning crew, take the whole safe out of the manager's office, and then drag the cleaning crew into the into the walk-in freezer where nobody could hear the gunshots and shoot them. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it was happening every couple of nights in Orlando at this time. So that was our big, that was the fucking boogeyman that we thought about when we were sleeping at night. And it's like, so when, we, when they opened up that door and we saw guns in our face, I thought, oh, shit, that's what this is. And sure enough, they dragged us back to the walk-in freezer duct tape my brother and I up and they had, there was a giant safe that they were trying to get out of there. They knew it was full of cash because it was new year's Eve and they just had a, a huge night. And so uh, we, I laid there and through a little peaky hole in the duct tape, watched them struggle to try to get this giant uh, safe out of the manager's closet. But there was no, nothing in the restaurant big enough with wheels that would carry that much weight. So they couldn't get it out. And they were fighting amongst themselves. And I knew that we were probably fucked if we if we waited. And so I just uh, I just yelled out to them that if they wouldn't shoot us, that I would help them get the safe out. And so this guy just came over and he kind of kneeled down next to me. He didn't say anything, but I just said, look, two doors down, there's a gap store and there's a giant freight dolly behind the dumpster. And we use that dolly sometimes when we have to move big equipment away from the wall to clean behind it. So that will definitely get that safe out of here. Please don't shoot me and my brother. And so uh, he didn't say anything. He stands up. They go, I see the, the freight dolly come by with the safe on it. They don't say goodbye or anything and they just leave. And uh, we wait there for an hour just to make sure that the coast is clear. And then we slowly get up uh, you know we're, we're duct taped all up so they had uh, <laughs> found something sharp we, they, they were cleaning the deli slicer and they'd had the guards taken off of it so the blade was still exposed so i was able to get my hands free by rubbing them in between the deli slicer blade and then just slowly got got free of our of our duct tape but they never caught those guys those guys were gone like a fart in the wind just, you know safe and all wow Holy shit. Okay, so what are you thinking in these moments other than I'm probably going to die? I mean, your probably heart's not, racing fast. much more than that. Your what heart's racing very fast. I mean, you, you did think very quickly about the dolly and everything. I mean. Yeah, I, well, I thought for sure I was going to die, you know, but I was so Mormon. I was kind of okay with that, but I was probably in shock a little bit and about it. And I figured I just it? had enough. My brother's just quiet. My brother's just in some way and you know what my brother in some ways was never the same in some ways yeah. he's still on that restaurant floor but um mm -hmm. but i i got therapy afterwards and he didn't opt to go to therapy was it better help uh yeah it was, <laughs> it was <better> help. <laughs> from a good <laughs> nifton anyway um but you got, went to therapy and yeah th that's the only way you could probably get through a trauma like that good grief so yeah. we've gone from that and then he okay, sold yeah, half more. the business to a guy that ended up murdering his mother-in-law. So then, have you ever? Is, is he for sure in jail for life? Is he dead yet? Like, what's the? He's not in jail. For, he's in jail for life. Uh, he keeps coming. He did at least keep coming up for parole. But recently, some guys that were making a documentary about that murder told me that he had done something terrible in prison. They didn't tell me uh, what it was because they didn't want to reveal it to me because they were trying to set it up for them, for me to interview him in prison. He probably and they wanted, someone. <laughs> just in I think, spoiler alert. I think he probably killed either a guard or his cellmate or something like that because he got transferred to a, they told me there's no chance he's ever getting out on parole. And he got transferred to a gladiator Academy, like the place that they put a place called the Ross correctional facility, which is like had, multiple documentaries made about it by just the rough customers that they have in at Ross Correctional Facility. So he probably is never getting out. And that's uh, that's just fine with me. Does he know that it was his confession to you that did him in? Oh, yeah. We went all through that in court. Okay. Uh, he, I, you know, I was essentially that, that was the only uh, testimony against him, I think, is that it was my testimony. So we spent a couple of days going over every little thing that he'd ever said to me, you know, in, in court, yeah. which was a wacky experience.
So <laughs> at what point does comedy enter the mix? <laughs> does it come in like still a ways away from that? You're in Alaska at the uh, Witness Protection Program. When that is, when they finally put the guy in jail. So I'm Alaska Witness Protection. Yeah. They put the guy in jail. I have been hiding for the last two and a half years. They had arranged to have my house rented for me and uh, and make the mortgage payments so that I wouldn't lose my house. But when I call to check on my house after the, literally, as soon as I hear the verdict, the verdict for the, is in, I call the, the, the office that is renting my house for me. And they're like, oh, your house was repossessed a few months ago because you didn't make any mortgage payments for the last two and a half years. And I'm like, you're supposed to make the fucking mortgage payments. So they had collected rent studiously until the house was repossessed by Sunbank. And then they were like, sorry, you know, we did our best, but we couldn't get, we couldn't reach you. Though I had had meetings with them with this, the district attorney from Cincinnati explaining to them that I was going to go hiding for, for a while and that I would be back as soon as I was able. So my credit was fucked. There was nothing to come back to, to Orlando because the, the house was gone. The business had crashed into the side of the mountain when, when they arrested John and put me in witness protection. So I just stayed in Alaska and I wasn't going to just keep renting a, a, a place because that's throwing money away. So I decided I would take the rental money that they gave me and I would build my own house. So I bought this piece of property outside of Anchorage and I slowly um, built a house. And one of my neighbors there was this uh, army ranger and, and a, a really nice guy, maybe the first non-Mormon friend that I ever had. And I'm completely Mormoned up at this time. I'm a Mormon preacher. I'm, I, I live and breathe Mormonism at this time. I don't you? swear. God, I'm, this is up until I'm about 40. So this is from still the married, ages. Still married. No still reason. married. Gotcha. Still married to the girl that I, that I met in the Eskimo village. And we uh, build this house out, outside of Anchorage and make friends with the neighbors. And uh, so I'm, I start hanging out with this guy and he got the, the, the Iraq war starts up again. And so they send him to Iraq. And so he and I are writing letters back and forth and, uh, he and I had had gotten into hanging out together before he left. And every time that he came back and our kids were about the same age. So our families would have Christmases together and our families would, would hang out every day together. So he said, Hey, I'm going to be back for Christmas on this one particular Christmas. All of my soldiers are trying this stuff. It's, it's like a, it's not um, marijuana, but it's like a synthetic version of marijuana. That's, that's legal in all head shops. So Maybe the I know the army doesn't test for it. Maybe that's not against the Mormon church either. So if you ever wanted to try marijuana, this is maybe where we should start. So he gives me instructions about everything that I need to get. He doesn't tell me the name of the stuff that I need to get. So I just go into a head shop, buy all of this paraphernalia. And then I say, and I need that stuff. It's not, it's not marijuana, but it's perfectly legal. And they go, salvia? Uh -oh. And I'm like, yeah, that, that could be it. So they sell me not synthetic marijuana. They sell me basically a really powerful um, psychoactive drug and send me back to, to uh, back home for Christmas. I wrap all this up. We have Christmas morning together. And then he and I decide that while we're waiting for the, for the kids to d finish playing with their games and g b before lunch, we decide we'll duck down into his gun room and try to give this synthetic marijuana a try. So, we go down there, we fill up the bong with icy water. I put this this salvia concentrate in the bowl and I hit it with the micro torch that I had gotten. And just, I go first because I'm trying to prove to him that I'm not a pussy because I'm just this Mormon guy and he's this army ranger and I'm kind of in my head trying to prove that I'm worthy of his friendship, I think is the reason I go first. And so I hit this bong of salvia, the very first drug I'd ever had of any kind. I'd never had anything stronger than ibuprofen for 40 years. No cigarettes? I, no caffeine? No cigarettes, no caffeine, nothing no, but tap no. water and, uh, and milk, really, where we're the, essentially, that's the Mormon stricture. So I hit this bong full of salvia and fall through the floor of his gun room. And there's like this short sensation of falling. And then I come up and I'm on the deck of this of this tiny water ski boat in the middle of a lake. And it's not Christmas. It's like summertime. 
and there's a bunch of guys around me and I'm coughing, 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 can't catch my breath, but it's like this whole other world. It's going to, it's just as real as the world I had left. And I'm just, I'm like, I didn't know what to expect from marijuana. And that was not at all what they show. In the movie. <laughs> no, no. But I was like, this is bananas, you know, because this, this is a really strong hallucination, but there was nothing psychedelic about it. It was just normal as any, as normal can be. Except that I'm I'm on this sailboat I'm not I'm on this water ski boat wearing a life preserver and Kaufman and talking to these guys and they're they're saying stuff like man we thought you drowned uh, you were under you were you had your face in the water by the time we got back to the boat we, we got back to you with the boat we thought that you drowned and I just keep laughing about how you know I'm in Alaska and it's Christmas time and I live in Alaska and none of you are real and this is a hallucination and I'm on drugs and so they look at each other and they get worried as shit because I'm their friend and I'm not talking right. So they think that I have brain damage. So they just race to the dock. They don't even put the boat on the trailer. They just side tie it to the, to the dock and we all pile into their pickup truck and they take me to uh, an emergent care. And, now, wait a minute. Uh, Do you recognize yeah. these guys? No, no. I, I, it, it, I don't, I've never seen them before ever in my life. They all tell me that they've known me my entire life. And that I've always lived in Tyler, Texas, and this is Tyler, Texas, and we all live, we all live in Tyler, Texas, and and uh, just hold still, we'll get to the hospital soon. And I'm no. laughing hysterically. Now, are you okay? Are these guys your age? 40, yeah. 40 years old. Yeah. Okay. 40 now, year old. When you look down at your body, is it your same body that you have in the other world? Yes. Yeah. And my name is Steve Cantwell, and they've known me as Steve Cantwell for most of the last 40 years. <laughs> okay. Okay. Go on, go on. So you're in, so, you're, you're in the emergency room and you just can't stop laughing. I can't la stop laughing because it's so real. I mean, the, there's magazines and there's pictures <laughs> in the magazines. They're just, they, there's, there's CNN is on in the waiting room and it's just like, it's just like regular, but I'm in Tyler, Texas and it's summer. And so I think it's going to wear off quickly you know i don't know how long mar synthetic marijuana is supposed to last but it goes on and on and on and uh so i finally go and get in to see the uh the healthcare professional and they test all my reflexes test my blood oxygen you know just do the normal almost drowned kind of stuff and they said my friends are like he doesn't remember anything he's got amnesia and she says well he probably just got his bell rung and true medical amnesia is really rare. So just take him home. He hasn't got a concussion. Just put him to bed. And if he doesn't start remembering things tomorrow, uh, give me a call and I'll recommend a specialist. So they take me home to this shit ass one bedroom apartment on a farm road uh, and take me in and using keys that were in the, my jeans pockets, open up the door and they have to get back to take care of the boat. So they just kind of dump me in the door of my one you know bedroom apartment. Names? Did they tell oh, yeah, you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I knew that. No, they, they, I didn't know their names when I, when I saw them, but you know, over the course of the next little while, I got to know them, their okay. names very well, but I just kind of kick around this one bedroom apartment and there's like pictures of me and like a family that I don't remember. I had a, apparently a, a, a dad and a mom and a sister who had died in a car accident when I was in high school. And there was pictures of me in the yearbooks that were on the shelf. And all of the things in this apartment were obviously things that I would probably buy, but I have no memory of this whatsoever. So I end up just sitting on the on the couch waiting for the salvia to wear off. Right. Th thumbing through old yearbooks of, of a high school that I didn't go to. And there's pictures of me with some of them with guys that were that I was in the boat with earlier that day. So, you know, it kind of corroborates their story. And I just kind of chuckle to myself about how fucking long this is lasting. And I drift off to sleep expecting fully that I would come back to my life in Alaska. Well, that didn't happen. The next morning I wake up and there's pounding on my door and it's one of the guys from the night before. And he comes in and says, Hey, you didn't show up for work. And I'm like, work, you know, I'm, this is a salvia. Truck. So he, he <laughs> loads me into his truck <laughs> and takes me down the road to this giant uh, apple farm where I have worked most of my adult life, apparently and he and I supervise, supervise migrant labor. And we're hot in the middle of the apple harvest. And, the, and we just, I stand there with a clipboard and tell anybody who will listen that none of them are real. And that, you know, I'm, I'm Mormon and I live in Alaska and I'm in the witness protection. And I just, you know, finished building my house. And even as I'm saying it, 
that story sounds more and more preposterous because they're all saying like, we've known you your entire life. You've never been to Alaska, bro. You, and you were Presbyterian, you know, you, you're not Mormon. And, uh, you just, uh, so we argue back and forth like, like that after a weird, they take me back to my one bedroom apartment. I don't feel like coming and hanging out with them. They, they're going to go drink beer and I'm Mormon. So I'm just like, I don't want any part of that. So they dropped me off back at my apartment where I just, I, I watch, uh, interdimensional cable TV for the, for the next few hours and then fall asleep again, hoping that I'll end up back in Alaska I'm starting to get worried now. I'm thinking maybe I'm in a coma in Alaska. Maybe I died and this is like limbo. I'm starting to get really serious worries. Yeah. Uh, by, by night number two, wake up the next morning, pounding on my door. He didn't show up for work again. He takes me to work again. And that goes on every single day. I live every single minute of every single day for eight years in Tyler, Texas. So everybody in town has known me my entire life they've all heard that i had a terrible water skiing accident and i have brain damage and then i can't remember anybody so everybody that comes up to me at the grocery store like hangs onto my arm and talks real slow and real loud <laughs> and i'm just like i tell them slowly that they don't exist and that i'm on a salvia trip and i don't understand what's happening but i live in alaska and i'm mormon <laughs> And I've got a whole family there that I'm trying to get back to. And they just kind of look sympathetically into my eyes and try to just give me space to go through this crazy fucking thing that I'm going through. So I try everything. I like, you know, the internet exists at this point. So I like, uh, I'm trying to figure out, I'm Googling everything about myself. I Google the murder trial, you know, because that's probably the most public thing that at that point, there's no no record of the murder trial. There's no record of Steve Cantwell in Alaska, which is not weird because I was kind of up there hiding, but there's no record of my family or anything like that. Yeah. But there is evidence that Steve Cantwell lived in Tyler, Texas for most of his life. And there's, there's stuff in the newspaper about my family's accident when I was in high school. And there's pictures of me standing there looking grief stricken. And there's just so every evidence is, that I grew up in Tyler and it fucks with my head. I'm, but I know all this stuff about the Mormon church and my friends love to get me talking about the Mormon church, you know, because they, I'm unstumpable as far as, yeah. it, as far as Mormon trivia goes. So I start Googling stuff about the Mormon church, trying to figure out how I know so much about the Mormon church and eventually end up convincing myself that the Mormon church is baloney just from the, the things that I, saw on the internet while I was in Tyler looking up old newspapers because the Mormon church didn't happen 2000 years ago. It happened not even a couple hundred years ago and it happened in a time of newspapers. So you can Google that shit and with an open mind can convince yourself that you, it's not true. So that happened to me while I was in Tyler. Okay. So at any point in this time, while you're on that trip, were you thinking, Maybe they are right. Maybe I do have brain damage. Maybe, or were you still in the, just in the back of your mind, able to hold it together going, something's not right. So for the first four years, <laughs> I push, I push everyone away. Like I, I, I'm, I'm trying with all my might. I miss my family. I miss yeah. my children. You know, I'm, I, I consider suicide as a possible way to get back to my family. I'm, 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 I, I go out to the lake sometimes thinking it's some kind of a vortex, you know, or I just, my mind, I'm boggled at how to get back to Alaska. But then right around the four year mark, I start to kind of, I have like a kind of a heart to heart with my friend. And he basically explains to me that, you know, this whole town's trying to be my friend and I keep pushing them away. So then rather than going to the store and when people come up to me that I went to grade school with and telling them that they're not real, I just t start telling them I had a water skiing accident and I have brain damage and I don't, I don't remember you, but you know, tell me your name and I'll try to remember it. And then, you know, we'll just go from here. So I started to try to remember people's names and just kind of to build, start to build a relationship with them from that moment forward. I think that's the moment when I kind of accepted the fact that I had brain damage and that I didn't have a family in Alaska and that I wasn't Mormon and I, all these things about being in the witness protection and stuff that seemed fantastical to me uh, the more I talked about it. And it made more sense that I had lived 
kind of a more simple life. I'd never married. I was, I'd worked at the same, for the same family farm since I was a kid. And I was probably going to work for them for till the day that I died. And I'd had the same group of friends since high school. And so I just started to kind of try to reacquaint myself with who were around me and loved me much. And Sorry. I've been very patient with the fact that I kept telling them that they were imaginary. And so I think I went from missing my family uh, to grieving the fact that I couldn't be with my family to realizing that my family was probably imaginary and some concoction that had happened in my brain in the, in the brief amount of time that I was unconscious and underwater. And, uh, then it kind of got to a place where I uh, realized that the fam- my family didn't exist. And so then started to kind of build a life for myself in Tyler, started to hang out after work, realized I wasn't Mormon. So I started drinking a little bit of beer. Hold on a second. I got to wait. Okay. Now, did you, when you were in uh, Googling things, did you start, try to Google your family too? Yeah. Just, none you of them existed. Them? No, no, Nothing. no. Okay. Only my family and Tyler existed. That was the right. only thing that I could find. But you could find info on the Church of Mormon. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Everything about the Mormon Church was the same. Was the same. Uh-huh. And so I started hanging out with my friends. I started uh, kind of getting into my life there in Tyler. They played in this little garage band after work. And so I started hanging out with them. I had I had come into my apartment in in Tyler the first night that they dumped me off there and there was a ukulele on the on the couch and I had never played the ukulele before but I picked up the ukulele and my fingers knew exactly where to go so I could just Mm -hmm. by muscle memory my fingers seemed to know like where to put my fingers on the strings to make chords and 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 how to how to play the ukulele and could play several cover songs just noodling around on the ukulele though I still don't know the the names of any of those chords, you know, it's just, I had muscle memory. And so I started bringing my ukulele and, and we would play the ukulele. I would play the ukulele and they would play, you know, the, the guitar and the bass and the drums. And we would just, you know, for fun, just play music after, after work at this apple orchard. And uh, after a few years, we started doing, we did a couple of parties and, uh, you know, like a wedding or two and played the fair once. So, you know, we just, you know, have a good time singing and, and playing this, playing the ukulele. And it was a good life. Yeah. Did, good, simple life. And um, did you have a relationship in that world with anyone? I didn't. No, no female relationship. No, nobody wants to date the brain damaged guy. Right, right. And, I, assume and, you, uh, I assume you weren't doing stand up in Tyler. I was not doing stand up in Tyler, but that was probably the first time that in my adult life, other than preaching, that I'd gotten up in front of people and kind of, you know, experienced uh, a crowd and and having people clap and cheer, you know, and I would, you know, talk a little bit in between songs and that, and that made me happy. And so, it, you know, it was kind of the first taste of performing, I think, in a, in a non-religious way. And so that probably led me to to stand up. Okay, so, so how how do we get yeah, out of Tyler, Texas? Been, is there anything else interesting that happened over those eight years <laughs> that you can remember? Uh, uh, it was really dull. Like, did you go it see was, a show? Was, did you go see uh, Tom Petty play or something or anything? No, like that? I was pretty poor, and so I couldn't afford much. And I had I had spent a bunch of money uh, for, for during the first four years going around and traveling like to my old hometown and seeing if it looked the same and just, you know, like doing a bunch of trips and like that, trying to find myself in some way. Uh, so no, didn't do much entertainment, but, uh, but so all of the laws of physics and everything like that, this is not psychedelic at all. It's just literally you yeah. just dropped in another life. It's way more normal than my regular life. It was, it was just, you know, just bone scrapingly normal. You yeah, know, that's true. there wasn't to be fair, if that was your story, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I job and yeah. it was it was fine. I had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> it was fine. Worked at this apple orchard, you know, ask me anything about apples. <laughs> so I was just, you know, everything's fine. At the eight year point, I'm walking across the park with a bucket of chicken to go join my friends at a picnic table. I can see them in the distance. And as I'm walking across the, the park, 
I get that same sensation of falling and I fall through the ground and there's that short sensation of falling. And I, I come out in on the floor of his gun room. I'm having a full on seizure. I'm just like rah, 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 on the ground. And my ex-wife is behind me hanging on to me and the room is spinning and it starts to slow down. And, and my ex-wife says, hang up the phone. I think he's, he's coming out of it. And so my friend who's in the room with her hangs up the phone. Apparently he'd been dialing 911 and I stop my seizure, you know, and I'm on the, on, it's like magic. I'm back in my life in Alaska and I throw my arms around her and cry and throw my arms around my friend or try to and cry. And I'm laying in a puddle of my own piss and it's still Christmas morning. And uh, my kids are all like crowded around the gun room door. What's wrong with dad? And uh, my wife is trying to cover for the fact that I've been down there doing drugs with my friend, which is a, not a very Mormon thing to do. So she's just like, he fell down, just go upstairs. He's going to be okay. And she shoves me into their downstairs bathroom to shower the piss off of me. And he, my friend goes upstairs to go get me some some sweatpants that I can borrow so that I can be presentable <laughs> for the rest of Christmas. And I just pour this story out to my wife while I'm in the shower. And I'm just like, tell I thought you were imaginary. And I've been this other crazy place for eight years. Total elapsed time, according to her, that I was on the floor having a seizure, 45 seconds. Wow. Yeah. What? So I experienced all that detail, all that. I walked into that gun room as a Mormon preacher and came out as an atheist in 45 seconds with none of the guilt from it, had moved past it enough to where I would, I no longer grieved the death of God in my mind. I just, uh, I just, uh, I had accepted it. And, and as soon as Christmas, I went upstairs to Christmas, Christmas lunch and saw all my kids like around this Christmas table and just started weeping and petting their hair and telling them how much I'd missed them and loved them. And those people, that was the last time they ever hung out with us. Like he went back to war and the family was polite to us, but that was the last time that we ever, hung. I was just way too weird for their <laughs> taste, you know? And so uh, we went, I, I just sat her down as soon as Christmas was over. And I was like, look, the Mormon church is bullshit. And I showed her a bunch of, of uh, websites and convinced her that it wasn't true and that we needed to have a hard reset as a family and that money wasn't what was important, but the fact that I'd wasted, we'd wasted 40 years of our life was important. And so we were just going to take a page out of witness protection and we were just going to move to Hawaii and change our, our cell phone numbers and not leave a forwarding address for the Mormons. So that's what we did. I called a real estate agent. I didn't owe any money on my house that I had built. So I just called a real estate agent and said, find me a cash offer by the end of the week. And I, and I did, I called one of my competitors for my cleaning business and said, you know, how much cash you got? I'm, I'm leaving town. And so I sold my house and my business and just hit the, hit the eject button from my life in Alaska, moved to uh, Waikiki, bought an old sailboat and just started uh, figuring water out skiing. what it meant. <laughs> I have never been water skiing to this point. Fuck water skiing. <laughs> okay, so fuck I have water a water skiing and fuck apples. <laughs> so yeah, so can you play the ukulele? Yes, I can still play the ukulele very well. Could you not before? I could not at all. I've never I've never taken ukulele lessons. That's what, and, and I still don't know I still don't know the chord names or even the string names. You just know where to put your fingers. I know where to put my fingers. I, I have one kicking around the house all the time. I play it. Uh, I play it on stage sometimes. That's what's mind boggling. Yeah, I is play you, ukulele. We, you know this? I play oh, ukulele in our band with really yeah. electric through an well, electric through an amp. Yeah, I have electric ukulele. Yeah. Go. It's a, so that's cool. Um, and it's cool that you were. I guess when you came out, you were able to go to the website addresses you were looking at in Tyler, Texas. You already knew where to go, and yeah. they were here when you went to them here. Wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute, wait, what? Say that so again? when he was in Tyler, Texas. Yeah, you, did you go back and see if those people were No, 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 what I'm oh, saying is no. he was looking up like the the, oh. the Book of Mormon, the church, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the websites in Tyler, when he was back here, he was able to go to the web, Same those ones. websites and they were active here. I feel like- New York Times was... wrote extensively about the Mormon church while it was happening. And so uh, 
the New York Times account of all of it is still still online. Okay, so have you gone back to Tyler, Texas now? And are those people around? So Tyler is nothing like the Tyler that I imagined. I think the reason why my brain took me to Tyler is because I had no knowledge of Tyler. And so it was going to get no kind of pushback from my brain. So it just it was a it was a blank spot on the map. And so that's where I went. But the Tyler that I imagined was this tiny little town with mountains all around it, kind of like the little town that I'd grown up in in Utah. And the real Tyler is much bigger and much flatter, and they don't grow apples, you know? So yeah, I, I, I didn't look for, I, I kind of did a cursory web search for some of my friends, but not surprisingly, they don't, they don't do exist. You miss, do you miss those friends? I do miss them. I get, you know, especially when I think about how kind they were to me, you know, I get, I, I, I miss them, but, uh, they weren't real. But does, so are those, are those memories, do those memories seem as real as yes. all the other memories? Just as real, wow. just as real. In fact, sometimes I will, I will think of a story that happened in Tyler and have to, I'll have to think back to, did that happen in Tyler or did that happen <laughs> in the real world? You know? Yeah. So it's just, all in four. Okay, so so hold on. Up to this point, we've gotten married early in Alaska, gotten uh, robbed, tied up, almost killed. Witness protect. Uh, worked with a murderer. Witness protection program. This whole then back to you know Alaska, Tyler, Texas for eight years or forty five seconds, and we still haven't done comedy number one. No. Yeah. <laughs> so. This podcast is sponsored by Paramount Plus. Everybody's streaming now. Nobody has old TV. Yeah, and Paramount Plus has got tons of channels. They got a bunch of sports channels. They got, you know, the regular network channels. CBS, BET, Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, MTV, the Smithsonian Channel. Tons of sports channels. That's what you like, right? NFL? Yes, all of that stuff. What is SEC? That's the Southeastern Conference. Come on, you live. Yeah, you live in Nashville. Got it. Should know. Masters. That's. I think that's. um, That's golf. golf. Yeah. Yeah. March Madness. I know that's basketball. But anyway, you can stream these on any of your devices: Android, iPad, iPhone, Apple TV, Chromecast, Fire TV, LG, Roku, Samsung, basically anything. So yes. So if you'll click the link in our description, you can subscribe and you get a free trial. So click on it. Support the show. Thanks, guys. This podcast is sponsored by TripAdvisor. Yeah, everything's opening back up. People want to get back out there. So uh, if you'll go to TripAdvisor and book through those guys, then you can really help our show out. Yeah, and you get a lot a lot of amazing deals. Yes, it's a great site, and you're going to be booking it anyway, so throw us a bone. Go to TripAdvisor. Help your girl out. Yeah, the link's in the description, so knock it out. Thanks, guys. This podcast is also brought to you by Hulu. Hulu. Yeah. Do you watch Hulu at all? I do. Everybody's streaming now. Yeah. There's no reason to have old TV. You have to watch TV shows sometimes when you're stuck in traffic or something. It's nice to have uh, streaming. Yeah, you'd be able to get it everywhere. And they've got tons of channels. I mean, you can go to the site and see all of the channels you want. You pretty much have everything you want on Hulu. Yeah. I've been watching Catfish on Hulu. And of course, that's where I watch The Real Housewives all of them well there you go and if you're not on hulu you can click the link in our description and get a free trial yeah so do it click the link below support the show check out hulu i'm always it's always fascinating to talk to comics like well when did you start and it's a you know interesting story but i i don't think we've come up with anything like this up to this point no 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 so we're <clears throat> anyway how wait did- oh, wait before we get to comedy how do you wrap your brain like do you believe in god now or are you atheist I don't know. Do you believe in great I don't know, spirit? No. You believe the Do you believe the energy that's running through all of this is created by some sort of greater energy, some kind, divine? I don't know. How, you know. I, I've had a lot of thoughts in my in my journey away from the Mormon Church. When I first stopped being Mormon, I I thought that I was atheist. But now, if you ask me, I cannot rule out the existence of God. I just know for a fact that there's probably not a Mormon God. You know, right. but uh, right. so I, I can believe in a God. I don't currently worship a God, but I can believe it, it, this all seems too complicated to just happen by happenstance. So there's probably something or Raylin, this could be a simulation of some sort. We could yeah. be playing 
a game of some sort. So that would, like, I don't know what I believe. I mean, do you think that, I mean, it's kind of, my first thought about it is there's a whole other world that's going on at the same time as this one. Parallel universes and such. Yeah, parallel yeah. universe. And the, the, the salvia pushed you there, right? And then, sure. so like maybe you're just gone for 45 seconds to them right now. You know, you're still walking across the way. Yeah. I think all the time when I'm about to, when I, when I do well on stage and I'm about to get off, I think all the time, what if I sink through the floor right now with my next step and I come up oh on the floor God. of that gun room again. And that's just like a fucking groundhog day that I repeat the next 10 years over and over again. You know, what if it's eight, every eight or 10 years, I go back to the starting point and just, uh, live another soap bubble of a universe you know so i don't know i think i think about it all the time my life now seems more imaginary than my life before the salvia trip you know because uh, because of stand up comedy you know when i was when when i when we moved to waikiki we my wife and i had never had sex with with anybody but each other and so we decided we were going to make up for lost time and we started we had this old sailboat and so we would bring tourist girls out on that sailboat and have threesomes with them. And we did, and we did that for like six months or so. And then, uh, and you guys fell way wife, off. You guys fell way off the wagon, way off the wagon. We <laughs> wanted to see what's on the other side of the wagon for sure. Right. So, um, we did that for a while. And then she left me for an Eskimo guy that she'd known since <laughs> high school. And, uh, so after I was just alone there on the island with, uh, took all the money. So I just, I only had the, the sailboat and the little scooter that I was driving. And so I just kind of was stuck there living this very simple existence, living on this sailboat and driving a little scooter around uh, Waikiki. And for the first time in my adult life, didn't have to make a decision based upon my family. So I, d I decided that I wanted to kind of chase that feeling that I had experienced in both preaching and also on stage with my cover band in Tyler. And I decided that I wanted to start doing stand up comedy. So oh, quick, I would just go, quick question. Yes. Do you remember the name of your cover band in uh, oh, yeah, what was Tyler? The name? Yeah, Electric Watermelon was the name of our, <laughs> was the name of my cover band. Fantastic. Sorry. I just yeah, I mean, not what not apples, by the way. Wow. Yeah, no, fuck <laughs> apples. That's too <laughs> much like work. Yeah. So. Uh, that was so that was my life. I just started doing stand up comedy in Waikiki and did that for a few years. L worked at a radio station there, a classic rock radio station called K Rock, uh, there. And, um, and then met some guys from Houston who had just opened a club here and they said, Hey, you got to check out the comedy scene in Houston. So I, I flew over to Houston to do a few shows and it was great. So I moved here. What five year? years ago five years ago so this is all fairly recent fairly recent yeah so when you say you just started doing stand-up uh did, did you have were you fans of or a fan of a bunch of stand-ups did you know anything about comedy or did you i mean did you have some material written how, how, how did you do that i did not know anything about stand-up mormons don't watch a lot of stand-up i wondered uh, yeah in fact we don't believe we think that loud laughter is bad so we're kind of encouraged never to wow. engage in comedy. Oh. So uh, I didn't have any fa any favorite comedians at the time. And so I just started going up and telling stories, telling these stories to, to people. And that was that was what I that was my material was just the stories of my life. And that's still what I talk about. Well, they're fascinating, yeah. but did you put a humorous bent on? I mean, they are. We were laughing halfway through. I know oh, it's, it's some heavy duty. It's stuff, so crazy. It's funny. You yeah. don't. You almost don't have to make it funny. <laughs> yeah, in some ways, all of my stories are are so dark that they're funny. Yeah. You know, because I don't really have any happy stories. No, it's been, a, it's been a dark old life, but it's so bad that it's funny. The only way to get through that kind of life is with ending it in comedy, you know, laughter, making people laugh. About. Yeah. So who were the guys that, that were starting a place in Houston? Who did you like, who did Pete, anybody take you under their wing when you got to Houston? Cause it, it, it must've been passing you around like a joint going, you got to meet this guy. You got to hear this story. You know, I can imagine the comedians that had met you just going, you got to hear this guy. 
So I got in with a group of guys at this club called the Secret Group. This guy, one guy in particular named Andrew Youngblood, and that exact thing happened. They he there was they had a comedy festival, and they passed me around to the the famous comics that that came to for that festival and said you got to hear this guy's story. So I told them my stories, and then I've been on a bu- bunch of their podcasts uh, since then. And the stories just kind of took off from there. You know, they, they put me on the Crab Feast. That was probably the biggest, uh, the biggest um, storytelling show at that time uh, on, on podcast. And it was, it was a huge boon to my career, I guess. And then COVID hit and we all starved for the better part of a year. And then now we're, that's, now we're, do you, that's Ryan Sickler's show. We just talked to him a couple, yeah. couple podcasts. Yeah. 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 I'm good friends with Ryan. Ryan's great. Uh, okay. Do you feel like you're eight years older than you are? Yes. Yeah. I feel like I've lived 60 years. I can remember chronologically every single one of those years. So, and it was horrible for most of it. And so it should definitely count. I'm now, were you, were you, did you ever think in Tyler, Texas that what if I just smoke some more salvia and make send me back? Did you ever think I did. I did. I did consider that, but there was a part of me that also thought that God was punishing me for, for smoking drugs and that maybe it would get worse. So I never, Mm -hmm. I thought about that and suicide both with about the same level of, of, um, of thought, you know, I thought either of those might work, but they, there's really good chance that either of those, uh, might make it a lot worse. God, it's mind bending to think what would have happened if you would have jumped off a building in Tyler, Texas. What does that cause? Do you snap back? Are you gone? Do you die on the other side? You know, I, okay. I mean, part of me was dying to find out, but I'll, I'll never know. Yeah. No. Okay. My next question. Could, was, I, uh, yeah. Oh, go, go. No, no. Finish your thought. I mean, it could have just gotten quiet for 15 seconds for the last 15 seconds of the 45 seconds, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Or I could have gone to a third, far worse location. Okay. Did you smoke weed while you were over in Tyler, Texas? Did you, cause you said you started drinking beer. I, I drank a little bit of beer. I didn't like it. And I never smoked weed. Cause I, I think part, and I never fooled around with women because I considered myself still, still Mormon for a big portion of that and still married. Yeah. And so just, and even now I have a hard time breaking out of the, the Mormon sensibilities that are so i mean my family was mormon for seven generations so that shit is in the dna so mm-hmm. you know wow you got journals to go back and read i would imagine i'm telling you man i do have journals i had some mormon friends when i was growing up and you're supposed to journal every every day every day uh-huh. do you have yep. families do families pass those down yeah in fact i have all of my ancestors journals from when they joined the church in Ireland and came out to America as pioneers and pushed through Indian country to, to uh, Utah and the Indian wars there. And just, you know, founding this little, these, this little tiny town on the edge of the Rocky mountains. Wow. Journals of all that. I, I, this is probably a dumb question, but do you like, does LSD and mushrooms, does that scare the shit out of you? The thought of doing that? Or have you tried that any kind of so DMT? So, uh lsd has always scared me because it lasts so long yeah, you know and and I've, and I've talked to a few friends who have and i had a bad experience with lsd when i was in high school uh a friend of mine this is kind of a little side story i've got time for one more quick story sure, on lsd please so when i was a senior in high school i had a job at a radio station and so my parents let me move out and get my own uh apartment so i was the only kid in my high school that had his own apartment and uh, a friend of mine, uh, somebody had given him two hits of acid at a Depeche Mode concert in Salt Lake. And so he was all crazy to try dropping acid. But he says, I can't do it at my house because my parents will know something's up. So can I come over to your house and, and we'll do LSD together? And that way nobody will worry about us. And I said, well, I don't want to I don't want to do it you know, but you can come over here and do it. So he did, he took both hits of acid at my apartment while I was sleeping. I had to, I had to be up at work for work at four o'clock the next morning at this radio station. So the, the plan was to take him back to his house before I went to the radio station. But when my alarm went off, he was, he says, I'm still tripping really hard. I can't go home. I'm just coming to the radio station with you. So we both jumped into my 1968 Volkswagen Beetle with the dim ass, uh, headlights and we drive to the radio station through the fog 
and we're driving through the fog and we see something up on the road just ahead of us and I stomp on the brakes and I drive right over this person, right, right over their head. And, and we get at, and so we get out in the fog, it's four o'clock in the morning and there's this dead guy. And uh, so, and this is the days before, before um, cell phones. So, and my friend's going bananas, like he, cause he's still on LSD and it's the first time he's ever seen a, a dead body before, but he has to wait there with them because I have to drive the car into town to call the sheriff's office to come out and process this, this accident scene. And so he has to wait there in the fog with a flashlight and, and wave it so that other cars won't run into them. And it's probably 20 minutes by the time I get back there with the cops. And he is not doing well since, <sighs> since I've left him. Well, he's out there. The, the, the flashlight gave way at some point. He's seeing shit in the fog and is out there talking to the dead body. <laughs> and so we take it. We, they take it. They, find, they can tell by the condition of the body that he'd been dead for some time and that we're not the ones that killed him. Oh, thank uh, God. And so they take our statements and I go on to the radio station to play top 40 music. So I'm at this radio station in the middle of a cow pasture in the fog in the early mornings. And like, as the sun comes up, you can just see just the swirls of fog everywhere out there. And my friend is still tripping balls on LSD. And so he thinks he can see this guy that we ran over out there in the fog floating around by our, by our car, you know, cause Mormons already believe in a magical world. And so that you don't have to add much to yeah. our little brains and, and, uh, and so that led to, I mean, he's pointing over my shoulder and screaming, there he is so much that I think that I can now see a little something in the fog just beyond, you know, my, my vision. And so I'm freaked out too. So uh long story short i wish i had a recording of that fucking show that must have been a some show you know you know the, <laughs> you, me, me, me trying to give the time and temperature in between a you know a wham song and a depeche mode song uh it sounded like i've been doing but doing battle with the unseen forces outside of the radio station but that that kid got institutionalized afterwards he could not he, he's brain snapped from from that experience and he never really spent much time in the last, my gosh, how long has it been? 32 years since then. He has been most, mo mostly institutionalized since then. Mm -hmm. And so that experience kind of has always kept me from trying LSD. Uh, yeah. Because, because I saw my friend literally go from, it, it broke him down. If the wrong thing happens to you, if you run somebody over when you're on LSD <laughs> or something, you know, it can crack your fucking brain. And so I've never done LSD because it lasts too long and because of what happened to my friend Paul. And, uh, but I have done everything else. I've done, I've done DMT a bunch of times. I've done mushrooms hundreds of times and uh, love all of it. Weed? You do weed now? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of never weed. salvia again, right? I will do salvia again when I am dying. When I am dying, when they tell me that I have got months to live or, you know, I am on my deathbed, I plan on keeping a small amount of, of salvia around for an emergency because you can live an entire human lifetime in an afternoon, you know? So that's, that's <laughs> no, my no, exit strategy. 45 seconds. That's, a, that's not a bad strategy. Uh, yeah. yeah. They should use it in all hospice care. I think they're leaning into mushrooms now in hosp hospice care. I think it's probably the yeah. same thing, breaking down those walls of perception or whatever. Now, have you met breaking anyone else? Your ego. Yep. Have you met anyone else that uh, has this has happened to? I have read other stories, and I know Ari Shafir has a story like this, and he and I have talked very briefly about possibly doing talking about this together. But no, I've never actually talked to anybody. I've never actually talked to anybody who's who's done that much salvia. It's just not a very popular psychedelic. No. Yeah, yeah, it's not. I think I did hear Ari's story. I think he was living underwater at the time, story. though. Yeah, he lived in an underwater world. Yeah. Oh, what? Which sounds like a lot more fun than a, than yeah. Tyler, Texas. And to be fair, I think he said his only, he was only there for a couple of years or something. I don't think he made it eight yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I hear stories about people that got stuck for 30 years as a coat of paint on a barn. They could feel every minute of every day for 30 years, the heat of the summer, the cold of the winter, not able to cry out, not able to move. 
th- every minute for 30 years. Yikes. Now my brain is starting to hurt a little bit. What? <laughs> okay. So I think for you in your situation, if I had to say why this happened to you, it was totally to jerk you out of the Mormon thought process and great yes. spirits. Like, no, there's more to this than where your brain is. And you have now have the kind of, I hate to say the word message, but you know, cause there's all that stuff behind yeah. it with Christianity, with the message, but you have a story to tell people to break the religion thing, you know, the, yeah. These different, like, what is Presbyterian, Mormon, like all these little things? It's all bullshit. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, we're all one. And yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it was just a, a, to you, it was eight years, but it was, you know, like, holy shit. Holy shit, Steve. I can't believe this story. Thank yeah. you. You were definitely a conduit for uh, stories. And yeah, and you're just spreading the word. And I think it's going to help people um, Thank you. break from those religious what are the words? Bind, ties that tie, bind. bond and the ties. Yeah. Any rut that a person's in, not just religious, but if you're in a relationship rut, if you're in a job rut, if you're in a religious rut, you know, I think that's the reason that that's the thing that people have used psychedelics for, for thousands of years uh-huh. is, is that perspective shift that human beings need. We can not, none of us see each other clearly. Uh, and so we have to kind of be able to step outside ourselves and not be ourselves for a while to kind of see, to get some sort of a aerial perspective of where you're headed, you know, yeah. Yeah. pull your head out of your ass is the best thing. And for just us. to love your life too, to be like, Oh, I love yeah. your life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Steve, I'm so glad you did this with us today. I know we're going over an hour, so I'm going to let you go, but um, okay. wait, wait a minute. One last yes. thing. All right. What is your own personal Willie Nelson experience? Do you was he around in Tyler, Texas, when you were there? Like, was there a Willie Nelson? His there? cover band open for him. <laughs> you got to figure that Willie is in every world, every every possible universe. You got to figure, right? Some things just translate. Yeah. Of course, Willie. Of course, Willie was in Tyler. <laughs> well, yeah, and people in Texas love my grandpa. He's so big oh, there. Yeah. So sure. he had to be in every world that there is. He's in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Where does he live now? Does he live in Maui? He's got a place in Maui and he's there now and they're getting ready to go back to Texas. Would you ever put electric watermelon together on in this world and tour? I, I for sure would. Yeah. Yeah. I for sure would. I always ask my friends if they want to start a cover man. <laughs> my production company is called Electric Watermelon. So I'm all set up for it. You should let electric watermelon open for you on tour. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to tell your salvia story every night. Then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Steve. Thanks so much for doing this. And um, yeah, dude, great. Thank Thanks for doing this. It was really great to meet you. And we'll have to, I'm, I'm sure there's more. My mind's tell. still blown. I'm probably yeah. going to be damning your questions. We're going to have to do this again. Definitely. Cause we're going to be thinking of stuff we got to ask. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Well, th- man. Thanks guys. Talk All to right. you later. Thanks man. Bye bye. Steve Cantwell is my favorite comedian. It really is the greatest story ever told. Yeah, my brain is still hurting from that. We got to get him back on because I've already got more questions. I do too. I have more questions. So, yeah, you guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, write, or rate, review, uh, you all could that write kind of good stuff. Us too. That'd yeah, be fun. Write a review and then rate us five stars. That'll help us out a, big, a bunch. Yeah, it matters. Those reviews matter. And come back next week for another fabulous comedian. Enjoy your groceries. I know your mama's name. Free Britney. Don't be an asshole. <laughs>